Following the construction and good performance of the first Italian dreadnought, Dante Alighieri prompted the Regia Marina to plan and build three ships of the Cavour class. These ships were the Conte de Cavour, Giulio Cesare, and Leonardo da Vinci. Of the three, the Giulio Cesare is arguably the most famous and interesting. She was laid down in 1910, launched in 1911, and completed in 1914. As built, she displaced 24,300 tons full load and was armed with 13 12 inch 46 caliber guns, 3 inch triple turrets, A, Q, and Y, and 2 in twin superimposed turrets, B and X, along with a top speed of 22 knots. The ship, along with her sisters, was completed amid the Great War and did not see much service. Yet, the Leonardo da Vinci was sunk in August 1916, being refloated in an impressive feat of engineering, and eventually sold for scrap in the early 1920s. While her sisters continued to serve the Regia Marina, and by the 1930s they were extensively modernized. Following her modernization, Giulio Cesare participated in naval reviews and Italian operations in Albania. When Italy joined the Second World War, she led Italian forces in one of the first major engagements, the Battle of Calabria, withdrawing after sustaining damage from a hit from HMS Warspite. Following the battle and repairs, she was present at Taranto when the British attacked the port in November of 1940 although not sustaining any damage during the attack, going on to take part in other surface actions and convoy operations until the spring of 1942, when she was placed in the reserve at Taranto, shifting to Pola where she served as a training ship. After the armistice, she was decommissioned at the Taranto dockyard until after the war. Giulio Cesare was transferred to the Soviet Union in 1949 as part of the war reparations paid by Italy. Renamed to Novorossiysk, she sank on October 25, 1955, after hitting a German wartime mine, while anchored off Sevastopol. Italian dreadnought development and the Cavour specifically were designed in light of early 20th century rivalries and alliances. To oversimplify for the sake of time, during the time period when the ships were being designed, the Regia Marina's two main rivals were the Marine Nationale and Kaiserlicke und Koninklicke Marina. At the time, the main threat was the French fleet, as the Italians were a member of the Triple Alliance and therefore allied to Austria-Hungary. The birth of Italian dreadnoughts began in 1909 with the Dante Alighieri, with some innovative features, especially in regards to armaments, as the 12 12-inch guns of the main battery were grouped into four triple centerline turrets, allowing all heavy guns to bear and broadside fire. Even though she was innovative, the Regia Marina looked to match the French with their new ships. When Italy left the Triple Alliance in May of 1915, they were able to match the Austro-Hungarians, as even though they were allies, there were underlying tensions. As complete, the Giulio Cesare displaced 24,300 tons and was armed with 13 12-inch 46 caliber guns in an interesting configuration, with A, Q, and Y turrets having three guns, while B and X were twin turrets. The secondary battery consisted of 18 4.7-inch guns and casemates, and to take from Mussolini's Navy, a reference guide to the Regia Marina, 1930-1945 by Maurizio Brescia, the ships had a rather classical appearance, with a long forecastle extending up to the barbette of X turret, small superstructures, two tall funnels, and two tripod masts. The Parsons geared turbines of the four shaft plant received steam from 20 boilers, 24 aboard Da Vinci, and the maximum speed was 22 knots. When completed in 1914, Italy had not yet entered the war and would not do so until May 24, 1915, joining the French, British, and Russians in a war against her former allies. The Regia Marina had an advantage in dreadnoughts over their Austro-Hungarian counterparts, and not only that, they had the Marine Nationale to help them. However, in the Adriatic, there was little opportunity for the capital ships of both sides to engage each other. Even before the Italian entry into the war, the French had suffered the losses of two battleships and damage to three more. Thus, the war in the Adriatic was somewhat akin to a guerrilla campaign, with secretive operations. The stalemate at sea can be compared to the stalemate on land, as both sides cling to the dual strategy of having a fleet in being, while also trying to attack the other's base. The battleships did not meet in action, although both sides lost ships. The Austro-Hungarians lost the Wien, the Veribus Unitas, and the St. Istvan, while the Italians lost the Benedito Brin, Leonardo da Vinci, and Regina Margarita. The Giulio Cesare and the Italian battle fleet mostly spent their time patrolling the south of the Adriatic, effectively blockading the Austro-Hungarians until the end of the war in November 1918. Following the war, Italy faced an unfavorable economic situation. Having to cope with the impact of large-scale demobilization, the budget for the Regia Marina was drastically reduced, the first consequence of which was the cancellation of the new Caracciolo-class battleships, armed with 15-inch guns, 
meaning that the Andrea Doria and the Caio Duilio laid down in 1912 would be the newest Italian battleships until the Littorio class in the mid-1930s. The post-war environment also saw a renewed Franco-Italian rivalry, which manifested itself in several ways, notably in the construction of new ships, especially cruisers and destroyers. In 1922, with the signing of the Washington Naval Treaty, Italy was allowed parity with France, even if the Italians did not begin immediate construction like the French. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, the two sides built up their cruiser and destroyer forces with ever-increasing skill and size. To get some perspective on this rivalry, we will look at the Franco-Italian Rivalry, Current History, 1916-1940, Volume 38, Number 3, by B.C. Goldberg, from June 1933, who opens up by saying, The immediate danger to the peace of Europe lies somewhere between Rome and the implacable Balkans, for Italy has dared to challenge French hegemony. Germany, despite all her potential might and menace, is but the background to the impending, possibly final struggle between Caesar and Gaul. Amid this rivalry, the Giulio Cesare visited ports in the Middle East and assisted with Italian operations on Corfu during the Corfu incident in 1923. As the decade came to a close, she became older and less useful to the Regia Marina. In came the Franco-Italian rivalry, as during the early 1930s, the French were beginning work on the Dunkirk class, causing the Italians to plan and implement the rebuilding of both Giulio Cesare and Conte di Cavour. The two ships were still in their original configuration until the reconstruction, with only a few alterations. In early October 1933, the Giulio Cesare was handed over to the shipyards of the Tyranian Sea at Genoa to complete the reconstruction based on the designs drawn up by Colonel Francesco Rotundi of the Naval Engineering Corps. Again, I will be taking from Mussolini's Navy a reference guide to the Regia Marina for an overview of this rather complex topic, as to do it properly would require a whole video. The forepart of the hull was completely rebuilt and lengthened, with a new raked oceanic bow built around the former ram bow. The stern remained almost unchanged, and a Pulesi underwater protection system based on two cylinders placed inside each side of the hull, designed to absorb the energy of an underwater explosion by predetermined deformation, was fitted. A new 75,000 horsepower power plant, which in fact delivered more than 90,000 horsepower on trials, was fitted, with eight boilers, two geared turbines, and two shafts. Speed was thus increased to between 26 and 27 knots. The superstructure was completely rebuilt, with a conning tower similar to that of the Monte Cucoli class light cruisers. Two funnels grouped amidships and a tripod mast aft of the funnels. Because of the new arrangement of the propulsion plant, Q turret amidships was removed, and the 10 guns of the remaining four turrets were rebored to 12.6 inches, the barrel's length and calibers decreasing correspondingly to 43.8. The development of new large caliber guns would have been impossible and uneconomic in the short term, and the now reborn guns could fire a heavier and more powerful projectile, although there was a problem of increased salvo dispersion. Secondary armament consisted of 12 4.7 inch 50 caliber guns and 6 fully enclosed twin turrets, and 8 3.9 inch 47 caliber guns and 4 twin mounts. To summarize the particulars, after the rebuild was complete in 1937, she displaced 26,140 tons standard displacement and over 29,000 tons full load. Her machinery consisted of eight boilers giving steam to turbines, driving two shafts giving her over 93,000 shaft horsepower on trials and a top speed of 28.2 knots. Her main belt armor was 9.8 inches thick, the main deck was 5.3 inches thick, the conning tower had a maximum thickness of 10 inches, the main battery had a face thickness of 11 inches, while her armament consisted of 10 12.6-inch 43.8 caliber guns and two triple and two twin turrets, with one triple turret and one twin turret forward in the same arrangement aft. The secondary battery consisted of 12 4.7-inch 50 caliber guns and twin mounts and eight 3.9-inch 47 caliber guns. At the same time, the light AA consisted of 37mm and 20mm guns. In 1938, the ship participated in a naval review and over the next year helped with further Italian operations in the Adriatic, like Albania's invasion. By June of 1940, when Italy joined the Second World War, the Giulio Cesare was stationed in the main Italian naval base at Taranto, ready for action. Unlike the Italian army in North Africa, which faced supply and logistics issues as ports like Tripoli, Benghazi, or Tobruk had not been properly readied for war. Leading us to early July, where an important Italian convoy consisting of a passenger liner and five freighters loaded with a little over 2,000 men, tanks, vehicles, and critically 16,000 tons of fuel and supplies 
departed Naples and Catania for Benghazi on July 6th. Initially, only the 2nd Cruiser Squadron, the 10th Destroyer Squadron, and 6 torpedo boats had been allocated to escort the convoy. Once learning the British were putting out to sea in force for a different reason, the Regia Marina put out to sea with two battleships, the Conte di Cavour and Giulio Cesare, along with six light cruisers and 20 destroyers from Taranto, led by Vice Admiral Igno Campioni, along with Vice Admiral Riccardo Palladini aboard his flagship Pola, six heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, and 16 destroyers from several bases in Sicily. After Mirz el Kabir, the British position in the Mediterranean was strained. To help strengthen it, the British intended to re-establish Malta as a major base, wherein it was decided to reduce the number of non-combatant servicemen and dependents on the island. These were to be removed in two small convoys. Admiral Andrew Cunningham was to interpose his Mediterranean fleet between these convoys and the likely route Italian surface forces would take. Simultaneously, Force H under James Somerville would create a diversion by raiding Cagliari in Sardinia. Cunningham left Alexandria late on the 7th of July. The front of his force was Admiral Tovey's five light cruisers, followed by his flagship Warspite and five destroyers. Bringing up the rear was the slow group, comprising the battleships Malaya and Royal Sovereign, the carrier Eagle, and ten more destroyers. The British were spotted on the 7th by an Italian submarine. The following morning on the 8th, the British boat Phoenix sighted the enemy main body, reporting it midway between Italy and Benghazi, heading south. The convoy the Italian main body was protecting reached North Africa later, delivering the supplies. At 10 a.m., Italian aircraft flew out of the Dodecanese in Libya, subjecting Cunningham's fleet to a series of high-level bombing attacks, with one bomb hitting the cruiser Gloucester and near misses lightly damaging Warspite in Malaya. While at 3 p.m., the Italian main body turned eastward to meet the British as the British steered roughly northwest. Decoded British radio signals led the Italians to expect Cunningham off the Calabrian coast at noon on the 9th, with Mussolini ordering Campioni to postpone battle so the Regia Aeronautica could attack the British the next day. By 6.40, both Italian fleets, Palladini's cruisers, and Campioni's battleships were headed north-northwest. The morning of the 9th at 7.32 a.m., Sunderland's from Malta found Campioni's fleet and tracked him for nearly four hours. It gave enough time for Eagle to launch an airstrike, but not until 1.15 did a group of nine swordfish who found Palladini's cruisers launch torpedoes at the heavy cruisers, which all missed. The side of the carrier planes told Campioni that British warships were nearby. His cruisers launched six more float planes, one of which located the British 80 miles away to the northeast. Campioni, who had maneuvered his forces around, began to reverse course back to engage the enemy. Cunningham headed northwest until 2.15 p.m., when satisfied he had positioned himself in between Campioni and Taranto, his ships steaming in the three groups I mentioned previously, with Tovey's cruisers first spotting smoke on the horizon a half an hour later at 2.47. Gloucester had been sent to support Eagle, leaving a limited amount of cruisers. Range closed rapidly, with Tovey first turning away from the engagement as more smoke came over the horizon. Then at 3.20, Tovey was ordered to engage, and the British cruisers, with less than 50% ammunition, began engaging the advanced line of Italian cruisers. The gunnery of the Italian light cruisers was very good, hitting their targets. It wasn't long after when Warspite entered the battle at 3.24, targeting the now fleeing Italian light cruisers. Meanwhile, when Campioni heard of the engagement, he swung his battleships and heavy cruisers toward the British position to hopefully catch them. This initial engagement broke off when the British also turned away in the other direction. All the while, Warspite fired another six salvos at the enemy cruisers as the time passed to 3.30 p.m. Cunningham had no intention of fighting both Italian dreadnoughts with only Tovey as support, signaling Tovey to not get too far ahead of him. Meanwhile, Campioni steamed ahead, followed by the Italian light cruiser division who had just been engaging the British. Campioni later praised the commander's conduct. He duplicated exactly what we had executed during our frequent peacetime tactical exercises, did not expose him to 380mm 15-inch gunfire after he was certain our large ships were heading toward the enemy, and succeeding in withdrawing his ships quickly and brilliantly from the line of fire. The shooting faded away between 336 and 348, as the Italians advanced and the British regrouped. At 340, Campioni's battleships turned north-northeast, steaming at 25 knots, their top gunnery speed while Palladini's six heavy cruisers had reached a point 7,500 yards ahead of Giulio Cesare. By 3.50, Tovey's light cruisers steered west-northwest, 13,000 yards ahead of the now oncoming British capital ships, as Malaya and Royal Sovereign had come up, but Royal Sovereign lagged behind Warspite by a considerable margin. At 3.52, Cesare sounded out with her 12.6-inch guns, 
sending their 1,157-pound shells towards Warspite, quickly followed by Cavour targeting Malaya. Warspite began replying while Malaya was not in range, and Royal Sovereigns strained her engines to get into the fight. To take from the struggle for the Middle Sea, the Great Navies at War in the Mediterranean Theater 1940-1945 by Vincent P. O'Hara, who writes, The Italian gunners fired deliberately, observing the fall of each salvo and correcting as required. Some Italian overs landed amid the British destroyers. Splinters sliced into Hareward and Decoy, while heavy rounds straddled Nubian twice. Her report noted, The second time, two shells fell within ten yards over. One shell grazed the starboard strut of the foremast abreast the steaming light. While the battleships duked it out, Palladini steered to close with the British, taking his cruisers to fire both on Warspite and Tovey's cruisers. Both sides were shooting well, with Warspite being straddled by Cesare. Fearing that she had found her range, Warspite altered course 20 degrees to port and increased speed, temporarily ceasing fire. As Italian lookouts guessed that Warspite had finally been hit and steering out of line, Cesare was hit at 26,000 yards by Warspite's last salvo, being one of the longest range gunnery hits in the history of combat. Plowing into Cesare's aft funnel, the shell detonated prematurely on the funnel's thin inner plating and blasted a 20 foot hole. The nose of the shell pierced a 37mm magazine, and ventilators pushed asphyxiating smoke into the boiler rooms. Fires erupted as multiple of her boilers came offline, dropping her speed to 18 knots. Campioni, not knowing how badly his flagship had been hit, assumed the worst, and with the prospect of facing the enemy with only one effective battleship, he ordered his battle line to turn away. This turn came at an opportune time as Tovey and his cruisers feared the worst, as Palladini was pulling ahead. Both Cesare and Cavour pulled away and fired at a rapid rate until 408. Palladini's heavy cruisers continued to engage the British, but once Warspite and the other battleships turned to face the Italian heavy cruisers, Palladini retreated, and the engagement came to a close later that evening. Following the battle, it was determined that the damage to Cesare was not extensive, and after repairs lasting a few weeks, she was back in service. Once repairs to Giulio Cesare were complete, the battleships unsuccessfully attempted to intercept British convoys to Malta in September. By November, the war in the Mediterranean had expanded, with the Italian invasion of Greece. The British Mediterranean fleet had been reinforced by the battleship Barham, the 8-inch cruiser Berwick, and the 6-inch cruiser Glasgow, and three destroyers. While in Barnard, Ireland's The War in the Mediterranean, he describes the coming events in early November. Admiral Cunningham sailed from Alexandria, both to rendezvous with the new arrivals, and to act as distant cover for merchantmen bound for Greece, Crete, and Malta. Force H, as was to be the norm, turned back for Gibraltar short of the Central Narrows. Barm and her accompanying ships kept on, rendezvousing with the CNC before stopping over briefly at Malta to unload stores and personnel. By dawn on the 11th, the combined force was away, heading northeastwards. Italian attempts to interfere were inept. All movements from Gibraltar were immediately reported by agents ashore in neighboring Spain. Still, aerial reconnaissance failed to locate any groups until they were too close to Malta for interception. A submarine made an unsuccessful torpedo attack on the battleship Ramillies outside the Grand Harbor. Still, neither destroyers nor aircraft could locate the Barham group, even though the formation had been spotted by Italian personnel on Pantelleria in Lenosa as it passed. Supermarina could only conclude in a general way that the British had passed within 300 miles of Tarento. The base at Tarento now played host to no fewer than six Italian battleships, which posed a great threat to British interest in Greece. Plan to send strike groups from both Eagle and Illustrious to strike the ships in the port at Taranto came to a head on the night of the 11th, only delayed by a fire in the Illustrious's hangar. Taking two hours to cover the 170 miles from the carriers to Taranto at about 11 p.m., the group split as intended and began striking battleships, like the Conte de Cavour and the new Latorio with torpedoes. The second group of swordfish came an hour later and began striking battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. The Trento and the destroyer Labeccio were hit by bombs that failed to explode, while the Latorio and Caio de Willio were both struck by torpedoes. Although Giulio Cesare was not hit during the attack on Taranto, the Italian Navy had lost its fast reaction battleship force as the four remaining units, including Cesare, were sent north for safety. Cesare did not have to wait long to come back south as a convoy heading to Malta was coming with Force H escorting it. That was to meet up with Force D, led by Ramillies, with destroyers to reinforce them as they approached Malta, only to turn back once coming too close to Malta. Complicating matters more was a second convoy heading towards Malta round about the north of Crete. 
On the night of the 24th-25th, the Italian high command knew something was going on, as they knew Force H had sailed, recognizing it as a large-scale operation in progress, and sailed with a powerful force themselves. Once again, Campione led two battleships including Giulio Cesare, six heavy cruisers, and four flotillas of destroyers, who were supposed to rendezvous southwest of Sardinia by the morning of the 27th of November. That morning saw both Somerville's Force H and Force D come into contact and move the convoy in a safer southeasterly direction towards the Tunisian coast. Well, Ireland has this to say about Campione that day. Campione knew nothing of the convoy nor the presence of Ark Royal and Force D. Assuming himself faced only with Force H at less than full strength, he felt justified in seeking a fight following the cautious post terento guidelines that had been given to him. Just before midday, however, one of his own catapult aircraft reported both Force D and the carrier. Despite being almost in sight of the Sardinian coast and its airfields, Campione considered himself outclassed and at 12.15 ordered his force to disengage on an easterly course. This instruction had hardly been executed when the opposing sides came into visual contact. Somerville's ships managed to send a few rounds towards the Italians, while at 12.44 p.m., Arc Royal Swordfish delivered unsuccessful torpedo attacks directed at Campione's battleships, delaying them long enough for the British cruisers to make visual contact once again, but Campione was determined to maintain his northeasterly course. More unsuccessful bombing and torpedo strikes came, but Campione broke contact at 1.51 p.m. Following this engagement, it was quite some time until Giulio Cesare saw combat again, as she helped to escort a convoy heading from Italy to North Africa at a distance in mid-December 1941. On the 17th, Admiral Iacchino's group included four battleships, including both Giulio Cesare and Vittorio Veneto. They engaged the British cruisers at long range, 32,000 yards to be exact. Having suffered splinter damage from the long-range Italian gunfire, Admiral Philip Vian, leading the British group, after not having found any enemy convoy, turned to disengage. The Cesare's wartime career was rather mundane following this, as in the spring of 1942 she was placed in the reserve at Taranto and then shifted to Pola where she served as a training ship. After the armistice, she was decommissioned at the Taranto dockyard until the end of the war. The Cesare was transferred to the Soviet Union in 1949 as part of war reparations paid by Italy and was renamed Novorossiysk. Being given many refits while in Soviet service, being used as a training ship, she sank on October 29, 1955 after hitting a German wartime mine while anchored just off Sevastopol. Maurizio Brescia has this to say about her sinking. Her sinking was quite similar to that of Cavour at Taranto in November 1940. In both cases, misguided rescue attempts combined with insufficient hull strength and internal subdivision led to the loss of the ships. The Giulio Cesare entered service as part of a fleet meant to counter Italy's rivals in the Mediterranean, hoping to fulfill that role at a distance in the First World War while being extensively modernized in the interwar period to counter new French construction, and even with this modernization, she proved not to be an ideal capital ship in wartime. To take from Maurizio Brescia one last time, the reconstruction of these two vessels provided a technical result of remarkable consistency even though when in wartime service, the two battleships exhibited all their structural, technical, and operational limitations. With that in mind and the limitations Italian command put on their vessels, her lack of success in operations becomes a little more clear. Surviving the war and seeing service with the Soviets is an interesting end to the ship, and I wish I could provide a little more detail about her service with the Soviets but it's extremely difficult to find sources, and I know there are some out there like Russian and Soviet Battleships by Stephen McLaughlin. It's rather pricey. Anyway, please remember to like and subscribe as it'll help the channel to grow. And until next time, my friends, have a great day.